Okay, so how do we get F? That's the, 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 the hammer question for today. So there's, there's a jillion theories you could think of, right? What's the most obvious theory of, of where F comes from? All right, so welcome back. We're, we're gonna finish this topic, um, search frictions um, in terms of wage uh, determination in a, in a model of search. Um, so last time we, we spent time thinking about how on the job search would affect the wage distribution we observe in the data. I'll take that to the, to the, to the, to the finish today. We'll finish up that topic. And the, um, the, the obverse question is also interesting. Uh, how could we get a, an offer distribution from behavior of agents? So I'm gonna give you one version of this that's kind of attributable to Burdett and Mortensen, the famous paper by Burdett and Mortensen that was uh, written in 88 and was published in 98. Um, it still serves as a benchmark for a lot of what, of what we do. The idea is that workers do switch jobs and do get offers while they're working, and that affects the behavior of workers who are unemployed. And all in some general equilibrium, these things have to be consistent with each other. So that's what we're gonna to do today. And I'd like to push as far as I can so we can do topics uh, next week. Okay, so um, I'll summarize last lecture as before, and then we'll talk about, uh, we'll focus on G. So given, given uh, an offer distribution, how can we derive the, the observed distribution? And then if I can push very hard, um, we'll move to the reverse direction and then if, if we still have time, I'll talk about how this informs a whole set of models about choosing where to look uh, when you're looking for a job. Okay, so last time, um, last time we um, introduced this idea of on-the-job search as a specialization of a model where people are getting productivity changes exogenously. And it's a bit more sophisticated because um, you're again trying to figure out the, the, the flow conditions that determine this distribution uh, of jobs that we actually observe because people will leave jobs if they get a better offer and they'll, they won't leave if, if they don't. And of course they know that when they're searching, when they're unemployed, so they also, um, that will affect the reservation wage depending on the relative probability of, of getting a job offer when on the job and when not on the job, okay? And, um, that was pretty straightforward. I'd just like to review that, to go quickly through that again. So we had, um, in words, we had the following. We said, we, you know, we're gonna have a continuous time framework. You can um, be unemployed, or you can accept a job offer that comes, but then you understand what happens after you get the job offer. You can get additional offers, and that can condition your willingness to accept. That'll be your reservation wage. Risk-neutral agents will um, consider this um, while unemployed, and this affects the distribution of, of G. So now I'm going to take that. Um, I'm going to take back to take to make, take you back to where we were last week when we derived uh, this this G. I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to give you an example of what G looks like under very simple conditions. Okay, so. Um, let me remind you how we did that before. Okay, so last time we derived the, the, um, the reservation wage, we took this general formula and we found the, we used um, that fancy result uh, using the Leibniz rule to get rid of the, the value functions from the reservation wage expression on the right-hand side and we ended up getting this really intuitive expression. The reservation wage and on-the-job search model depends on the opportunity uh, um, the, the, the income in unemployment plus a differential, and then you've got this complex integral on the right-hand side, which involves um, the distribution of, of wage offers. Okay, now if you, knew, if you know what the steady state of unemployment is, which we derived last time, you can actually use this to derive the observed wage. And I gave you some introductory remarks showing or arguing that what, it, what you observe is gonna always be like a, a rightward translation of what uh, is offered workers, because workers can always refuse. They don't have to accept jobs that are inferior, unlike the productivity model, 
the workers can always just ignore offers of, of work um, that, are, that pay less. So that means that G has to be somewhere to the right and below F, and in the, in the words of statistics, it has to be stochastically dominant, or F is stochastically dominated by G. So derive that G, we went through this, um, this idea of defining flows at each point in the distribution, sort of like think of a, each atom of the distribution of the support is like a bathtub in itself. You can define all the flows into jobs that pay no more than, than W, and you can think of all the jobs, uh, the workers leaving jobs that are paying no more than W, and that has to hold for every W, so that gives us a, a sort of a window on this, on deriving the distribution. So that's where I stopped last time. So again, the flow of workers um, uh, into, into the distribution, paying no more than W has to be this first expression. And then the, the outflow of workers um, job from all jobs that, that are paying less than W for any given W on the support would have to be given by this expression. So if you look at it carefully, you see that it looks like, and this is a, a, an exceptional feature of the model, uh, that G is actually separable in the sense that if you put the left-hand side, if you put this first expression on the left-hand side and put the second on the right-hand side, we can actually solve for G. So G is a function of W through um, the F function. Okay, and I'll show you that's actually a, a valid distribution. I'll show that in a second. But let's just do the, the, the arithmetic or the, the algebra, if you like. So uh, this is what I didn't write up on the screen last time. It's a really lo logical thing. For any given W take between WR and the top of the distribution, this has to hold. So again, that's why I call this a functional equation. It's a function, it's an equation involving functions. Okay? And it's gonna give us, um, it's gonna give us the ability to solve um, for G. So again, remember I told you last time, think of G as like a, as like a filtration of of the F. If I take what F is, you derive the G, um, and later on today we'll go in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's just, if you just do the, the algebra, it's quite simple. Um, because we know what U star is, U star is a function of those primary, those, those primitive uh, uh, elements of the model. The in, the um, this lambda factor, this uh, inflow uh, into unemployment for exogenous reasons, and then we have this incidence when unemployed of a job offer, and then we have this reservation wage which is endogenously defined in the model, endogenously generated in the model as already shown. Okay, so if we just put those two together and we can just, uh, I'll just uh, write the, um, I'll write the first um, sort of, uh, step in the der derivation and then we'll go to the end just to, you can do it on your own if you want. So it's alpha zero times F of W minus F of WR. Remember, def d WR is a, is a fixed parameter in this model that is, falls out of the, 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 um, the model's exogenous parameters. So we know what w WR is from the previous expression. And given that, we can des derive at any point in time this object okay that's the left hand side and the right hand side we've got um, as before lambda plus alpha 1 1 minus f of w and b please note that some of these expressions involve wr which is, is, a, is, a, is a constant in this model given lambda alpha zero, alpha one, et cetera, and the distribution uh, F, but uh, uh, you've also got W, so for any given W, this has to hold. That's, that's the whole idea that, that's gonna push us to find G, because we have alpha zero times one minus F WR divided by lambda plus alpha zero, one minus F WR. And then we've got the magic G. Okay, so that's that separability I talked about. G is just hanging out there by itself, so we can actually just do, we can simplify first. The first thing to do would be to simplify. Let's do that quickly. 
Okay, so we just cancel that. That's nice for any, they're, they're non-zero, so we can cancel that. And then we can just solve for G. And then we're gonna ask the question, is G really a, a distribution or not? Because I might be just trying to pull a fast one on you, right? <laughs> we need to check that. It's always true in, in, uh, in economic models, unless you've made a mistake. Um, it should be indeed a distribution, okay? So G, what does G look like? G is just gonna look like this. It's gonna be lambda times F of W minus F of WR. This is kind of a magic formula. And you're gonna see that this is, it generates some issues with the Bort Burdett and Mortensen uh, model because it's kind of a weird distribution, okay? So it's not what we observe in the data but it's an implication of the model. So we have to have a good story for why, despite this very reasonable model, we get observed wage distributions which under most normal dis assumptions for F don't necessarily lead to a G uh, that we see in the data. So there are ways to do that, and we'll talk about that as well later on, but um, it's worth getting that out on the table right away. I mean, this, is, this model opened the doors, but it didn't, it didn't close many for a lot of people. Okay, so we have the alpha one parameter showing up, that's the instance of on-the-job offers, and then um, f of w, and then one minus f of wr. Okay, so remember, this thing, is, this thing is fixed. There's a dependency on w, and there's a dependency on w. So that's, that's an interesting, it looks like it could be a candidate for a CDF, a cumulative um, distribution function. Again, it's a mapping. Think of, think of this as a mapping. This function map, maps um, of the offer distribution F. And again, it's a function, it's not a, it's not a single um, value of a variable, it's mapping a whole function into, into this new function G, um, defined for all W coming from what interval? What's the, what's the support? Right? The reservation, no one takes a job less than the reservation wage by assumption, that's, that's, that's how you define the reservation. And what's at the top? Well, yeah, what we always said was the top. There are versions of this model where you have infinity, so maybe there's some very small probability you get a very, very high wage, but we, I don't like those, I don't like to get people, you know, um, upset about things like that. <laughs> okay, so there's this highest possible wage just by for whatever reasons. All right, so how do we want to, what are the tests we want to apply to this G to make sure that it's a valid CDF? Okay, so just put on your statistics hats. Um, is G of W a valid CDF? Okay, so it has a support, and we already d identified it. There it is, that's, that's okay, but that's not going to get us very far. What do we need to know? Again, remember, this G is like a, it's a cumulative distribution function. Anything below, um, I mean, it's giving us basically the probability of observing anything at the value W and below. So the endpoints have to be constrained. Say it again. Right, so what's, so what's the bottom of the, of the support? G of WR equals, Zero. good, and G of W upper bar equals, One. okay, so we can check, we can just plug it in and see, hopefully it works, does it work? If you put in, if you put in, no matter what F is, if you put in WR for W, then you get, it works, right? And if you put in one uh, for, if you put in W upper bar for, for that uh, value, it should also work. How do I know that? 
because because the num numerator and the denominator cancel and you get one. Thank you. <laughs> I was actually asking you to tell me. <laughs> so check that on your own if you didn't get it. It's important. What's, most impo what's more important than that? It's true, just plug it in. So what's more important than this? What, what is absolutely important for a CDF? It, it cannot be decreasing. It can be flat and maybe can pick up again. It has to, it has to touch it at one. We already figured that out. But it can't go down. That's, that just violates what a CDF is. Cumulative can never, be, neg never have a negative uh, slope. So we have to check that. So we have to ask whether G prime, and that, and that using our, you know, our notation, that would be small g, just like small f is the density of, of big F. And that baby is, I would just write out the answer for you. Because you have to use, it's a, different, it's a derivative with respect to a quotient, so you have to use the quotient rule of calculus, which isn't that hard, but sometimes people forget. But it's going to be lambda plus alpha 1 times 1 minus f of w times lambda little f of w divided by, that's a, that's a little, that should be a 1. And then we've got 1 minus f of wr times lambda plus alpha 1 times 1 minus f of w. So that looks kind of nasty, but you can see that the thing is always positive. So no matter how we slice it, you know, if f is a, if, if f is a CDF, then f, little f is always positive. And therefore, this thing is always going to be positive. You just look at it carefully. You can see it's always going to be positive. So we're, we're in business. G is a valid CDF, cap G. OK. And actually, what's really neat is you can actually derive the rate of job-to-job -job uh, transitions from this model. So that you, you know, we've already figured out the unemployment rate. And we've figured out a bunch of other stuff. We've, 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 some, we've derived this distribution by characterizing gross flows into jobs paying no more than any arbitrary W along this distribution. But we can also figure out the rate of job change. Okay, and how would you do that? Well, first off, what's the first thing that goes into the job to job change rate? To change jobs, what has to happen? You have to get an offer first. So what's the probability of that happening? Right? And then what happens? Then it has to be acceptable. So how do we figure that out? Well, it, it has to be over your current OK, it's going to be, well, let's go slowly. Um, it's got to be above your reservation wage, right? And it's going to have to be from the, over all instances of, of W in the already existing distribution of wages, G. Okay, so it's going to be an expression that involves not only F, but also G. So it's going to be going from the bottom to the top of the probability of getting something better, and that for all values on which we're considering in this existing wage distribution. Do you guys get this? Is it okay? I mean, <laughs> it's, the, it's the rate of job-to-job -job transition. So it has to be better than what you've got for all points on the distribution um, of wages that we're observing in, in this stationary world where the inflows are equal and outflows at each point has to be equal to that. Okay, so that's the, the rate of job-to-job -job transitions. Now remember, these are transitions that don't affect the stock of employment, and they don't affect the stock of unemployment, because we're, everything is steady, and you still got this turbulence like under the water. If you think, think about the, like a pond. 
uh, everything's very stable, but underneath, you know, there are a lot of fish swimming and doing all sorts of stuff down there, right? You, maybe they're dying, maybe they're being born. <laughs> Those types of inflows and inflow, outflows we won't be able to see because the level of the water is stable. And that's the way to think about this. This is the rate of job to job tra transitions. And you can see it depends on a lot of interesting stuff. It depends, um, especially, of course, on the incidence rate, as was already pointed out. But it also depends on the shape of G and F. OK, so how do we get F? That's the, 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 the hammer question for today. How do we get, how do we get F? <laughs> so there's, there's a jillion theories you could think of, right? What's the most obvious theory of, of where F comes from? Again, you're all economists. It's great to have master's students. You're all brilliant, so yeah. Where does F come from? Right, because I, all the discussion to date was conditioned on F, and now I'm going to try to derive F. But you can derive F in many different ways. You need a theory. You need a theory how wages are, are determined. So what's the standard theory of wages that you learned as an undergraduate? I mean, don't be shy. What kind of theory? could help us. So who wants to start? Standard stuff. Firms demand labor and workers supply labor. Right, so neoclassical labor market theory. That's the stuff you'd learn any, you know, call it Marshall. So Marshall supply and demand. So you already see that's kind of a problem because the whole course is predicated on not, not using supply and demand because we think they're frictions. So, um, but still, you know, it, it, it's, it's an interesting way of thinking. We know that productivity of workers and the willingness of workers to work are kind of the essential factors. This is kind of you know, just, just to remind you what I'm talking about. Um, any sort of theory that base, was based on that would have to have relative supplies in the background. But still, it doesn't explain why people have different wages. And we know from our theory that there are different wages. So this is not going to get us very far. Right? So I, I'm, I'm trying to, OK, so anybody else want to have a, a guess? <laughs> Remember, this, this theory, the Marshallian theory of, of, of labor demand would say that everyone's the same, basically. And firms, you just reach into the, into the market and grab whatever labor they want. And the workers can supply whatever they want and somehow we get a result. That's not going to help us. So, But you should be aware that that's you know, something we think about. Yeah? If firms make different profits and each firm offers because of this, the different wage OK, so the firms might have something to do with this. OK, so I'm, I'm going to go slowly because I, I, you, you've given me the, 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 the final answer already. <laughs> I, I don't want to, I don't want, you don't want to take my drama away here. This is the, this is the whole point of this, my you know, last two lectures. I want to have some fun. Um, so how about firms set wages, OK? But firms set wages in a way that they can exploit their power, OK? So we, Joan Robinson called that um, monopsony. Joan Robinson was the only woman who came this close to a Nobel Prize before Eleanor Ostrom, OK? And she should have gotten it, but she didn't. Uh, I'm glad I'm saying this on television. <laughs> it's just a, a man's world. It was terrible. She was a brilliant economist. And she had this idea back in the 30s that firms set wages, and Marshall basically got it wrong. Okay, and you, can comp you can discuss that, but it, it's just a, it was a challenge. Firms set wages. And we do observe that. When you go apply for a job, you're probably going to get an offer. And then it's, it's usually like take it, to leave, take it or leave it, not let's haggle about it now, unless you're really quite talented, like you're a superstar lawyer or a programmer. Maybe you can haggle, you can, argue, you can bargain. But normally, you just get an offer. You want to work for McDonald's? Here it is. 10 euros an hour, take it or leave it. 
Okay, so, but Robinson said it was because of their market power. So Robinson had this idea that a, a company would be in a town and dominate the market so much that the firm could set whatever wage it wanted. If it set too low wages, the, the workers would run away, migrate to America, um, but um, there's probably some optimum. Okay, so we're gonna call that monopsony. Monopsony theory. of labor demand, or let's call it labor and wages. Okay, the problem with this theory is that we don't really observe single company towns that much, maybe Volkswagen and Wolfsburg, but in fact, it's usually like oligopsony, and even then you have, a, you have to think about competition, and maybe there's not enough there's not enough homogeneity, uh, heterogeneity in the data. There's not enough, there's not enough, um, we're not gonna observe different workers making different wages doing the same thing. Okay, so as much as I like the, the, the Robinsonian theory, um, we're not gonna use that either. But we're gonna use a variant of this. We're gonna use a, like a, a slight twist, and that's what you were saying, is that firms set wages, but they're kind of disciplined by the market. They have to deal with, with their competitors. All right, that's the, that's the insight. Um, and uh, the big proponent of this, this theory is, is, you could say the father of this theory was Dale Mortensen and Ken Burdett, but actually the guy that pushed this is Alan Manning of the London School of Economics. He's a really smart guy who's actually, um, been pushing this for a long time and, I, and people are starting to get the message now. So he wrote a book in 2005 called Monopsony in Motion. And that book is uh, kind of a, it's kind of a super, sort of like a Wundumschlag, sort of going after all the points in, in a single book. Okay, so I'm gonna call this Wage Posting. Alan Manning. So if you're interested in this, so you might think of him as taking Joan Robinson and dynam dynamizing the theory. So that's why it's monopsony in motion. Remember, monopsony was Joan Robinson, um, and he's putting putting some frictions into the into the world. So we're going to show how. If you add a little bit of friction, you can actually, it can take you a long way. And the friction would be that firms, are, they wanna make money. And they can post a wage, and they can get a worker, okay? And if they don't get a worker, they don't have any profits. So they wanna have a, and the question is, if they've got a worker in hand, what can they do? Can they try to push wages down? Well, if they do, they're probably gonna increase the probability that worker will leave. But if they raise wages, they'll retain the worker. And what's the cost of raising your wages? Why would a, do you, you observe firms here raising wages in Germany? Uh, no. <laughs> Why? Because they, wanna, they don't wanna make losses. They wanna, reduce their, they wanna reduce their wage bill. So this is constant tension. You pay higher wages to keep your workers, but if you pay them too high wages, you're gonna, not make any money. Okay, so wages have a direct effect that's negative on your profits. They also have a positive effect. This model gives us all that stuff. Okay, so it's really, it's amazing. So firms will post wages and have pros and cons of raising or reducing their wages. That's the theory. Okay, so pro, pros and cons of raising or cutting wages. So you can see that, that in a sense, we're forced to look at equilibria in the sense that a firm is already, is trying to enter a market and is trying to decide what wage should I post? Then I have to look to my left and look to my right and see if I can make any money by changing my strategy a little bit. That's what we call a, an equilibrium, sort of an equilibrium behavior like a Nash equilibrium, given what my competitors are doing, should I change my, my particular wage policy? And that's how um, Burdett Mortensen and Manning uh, derived this, um, 
this wage offer distribution based on what's already going on. Remember, we're trying to go, the idea is to go from G to F now. G to F. We already went from F to G. So the, again, there are many different theories you could cook up, and some people have, um, with frictions that could give us some sort of wage distribution. There are lots of clever ways you can do this, but this is, the, this is like the benchmark way to do, this, to do it. All right, so I'm gonna, again, let me, let me just write this down because this is a great question for the exam. I just, just let list the, what are the benefits and the costs of raising, you know, in terms of you, now you're a firm, you're a capitalist. You raise the wage, you're gonna lose some profits. Think about it. Profits are equal to your revenue minus your, your, your wage costs and any other costs you have. So if you raise, where are you going to? But at the same time, you might retain the worker in a world of on-the-job search. You may be poached by other employers. So if you pay a higher wage, you'll have less poaching. You'll lose fewer workers on that account. So that's the, the brilliance of this model is this sort of balance. And the balance, the equilibrium will be that every point on the distribution is characterized by indifference between that wage and other wages. So given that I'm, I'm paying 10 euros an hour at McDonald's, if I pay 11, like my employer competitor down there, I'll have more profits because uh, I'll keep more workers, but I'll lose because I'm paying $11 an hour, 11 euros an hour. Okay, so let's take a really simple example, and this is also in the in the reading, okay? So the, let, me, let me just write this down. Pros and cons. Uh, pros, you um, raise wages, lower wages. Okay, so again, uh, this is how we, we do this in Betriebswirtschaftslehre. We have a two by two table. <laughs> so if you raise your wage, you have less turnover. And I call this poaching. The, the, English, the American English word is poaching. When somebody steals your worker from you, you know, like Harold Ulig used to be our, my colleague, and then Chicago came and poached him from us. Right? That's a. So that's. Um, and if you raise your wage, you have lower profits. If you lower your wage, of course, you're going to have more profits and you're going to have more turnover. And think about it, turnover is a cost for firms. That's the, the beauty of these models, they stress that, um, you know, if you lose workers every other day, you're not going to be able to produce very much. So firms, firms want to retain workers. So it, nowadays, German firms complain about having too much turnover. They can't find workers and they can't keep them. That's because right now the labor market's hot. So if you go on the market this year, good for you. You know, you're going to have a good, at least for the, hopefully nothing happens in the next six months. But the idea would be that you have options and that kind of makes the firm want to keep you. So they're not going to cut your wages. The opposite is true when unemployment's high. So let's, let's take an example that will make this very clear. So let's take a previous formula. That, remember we had this, we, we derived G. So let's take a, a simple example. Let's take an example of um, G when in our model, there's a single rate of arrival. Okay, so it doesn't make any difference whether you're unemployed or on the job. The rate of arrival is the same, but you can still get job offers when you're working. So remember that, that first, that alpha zero minus alpha one term is neither positive nor negative. So that makes things really easy. That means the reservation wage will be exactly equal to B. Okay, that's kind of helpful. It's just an example, okay? So WR equals B, it's just helpful to solve it. And then you can plug it into our formula that we already had for G, then G of W is gonna look really simple. It's gonna look like this. It's gonna be lambda 
times f of w divided by lambda plus alpha times one minus f of w. Okay, so you tell me what f is, I tell you what, w, what g is. That very complicated formula we had before is collapsed into this very simple thing. So you can see that it has all the same properties as before. And if you want, we could take it, just to make it really, really simple to see, we can take a, again, I still have to tell you what F is to get G. So suppose, suppose we had a uniform distribution. Suppose you, your wage offers were coming from a uniform distribution, just suppose. So it's equal to one, right? And we'll make it even easier. We'll say the support is the, the support for the potential wages, not the reservation wages, is coming from zero to one. So we'll make it really simple. Um, Okay. So in other words, it's possible you could have um, I mean, some, some offers might just be really terrible, like almost zero. Apprenticeship type or, you know, practicanten learner. Okay. Um, that means that what's the, what's the cumulative distribution for the uniform? Again, I'm doing this for a reason. It's really easy. What is F? F is the integral from zero to W, and this is a constant, it's one. So we'll write it out, zero to W equals one times DF, which is F, which is DW equals W. Okay, so it's a linear cumulative distribution. I'm doing this just to make it easy. Okay, so make it even easier to start. Suppose, suppose also that the unemployment benefit is equal to zero. Just to get, again, get us, get us going, we can fix that in a second. So that means that we can actually draw, we can draw the, the CDF for W, for the offer distribution, and we can also assume it, we can We'll start doing that. So F of W, what does it look like? Well, support goes from zero to one. We said that already. So the offers the workers get have a CDF that looks like that. It's just a straight line going from zero to one. Okay. Now, to get G, we need to make some assumptions about the parameters. Remember, we already assumed that alpha zero is equal to alpha one, but now we have to give it a number. Then we can actually draw a picture, okay? Because we already see what G looks like. Look, that's what G looks like. If I, if I tell you a little bit more, we'll be able to draw that. So suppose, suppose also that alpha is equal to 0.1, so 10% per unit time. And lambda is 1%. Okay, so that means that the rate of job dissolution is 1% per period, and the rate of uh, offers would be 10% per period. So we can use that already to solve for the unemployment rate. Okay, that's just going to be lambda divided by alpha plus lambda equals 9%. Okay, and then we can actually derive G. G of W is equal to what? It's gonna be 0 0.01 times the W that we have divided by 0 0.01 plus 0 0.10 times one minus W. Okay, so what does that object look like? It's going to look like this. 
It's going to look like a, a bowed out version of F. It's going to look like that. So that's the G that results from this really simple looking, primitive looking F. This is, remember, this is F, and that's what G looks like. Okay, so you can see it stochastically dominates, like we said before. And if you want to make, if you want to make WR, if you want to make a, um, B positive, so this unemployment income, that rules out observing any wages that will be less than B. So, but you can actually derive that from the formula as well. Um, so that would be, that would be like having the same F But now we'd start at B. So the right. So this this new G would be would lie not only below, but there would be parts of it that, that lie at the zero uh, offer to the right, absolutely to the right of of F. And that's because nobody would take a job less than B. Right? Workers would, wouldn't, wouldn't do that. So it's kind of a, a more reasonable version. I mean, everybody knows. I mean, there are people who do take low, uh, you know, we know, we know apprenticeships are kind of like zero wage jobs. Maybe they're paid a little bit. Um, this, this, this model can also explain why you have those in, in labor markets. But um, the point here is we have a in, even in a simple example where you assume the arrival rates are the same in unemployment and on the job, you still get this, this pushing, this stochastic domination of F by G. Okay, remember that. So, stochastic dominance. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to give you these notes um, in probably this probably today, up to up to today. So I'm, there's, there's, it's nice to write along because sometimes you might you might look at this and say I don't know what the hell he was talking about. So, but I will give this to you, so you have an extra source of um, of um, information to work with. So now I want to take this result um, and. Now I want to actually go after F because now we've, we still just we I've just shown you how we get G, but now to get F from G we need a theory and we need to know what that G is. Okay, so we need to kind of do the same exercise we did last time. If a firm posts a wage, what is what are, what what are the consequences in terms of inflow and outflow? Okay, so like you're starting you're starting a a, a Durna uh, Buddha. And you want to attract some workers, you got to pay them something. If you pay them too much, you're not going to make any money in your, for your dinner or your brat for sex and dreising, whatever. Sex and dreising. You're not going to make any money. So you kind of you've got to you've got to get that right. And in an equilibrium, a firm will be indifferent. There'll be enough entry. The idea is that the wage structure has to somehow, you know, the strategies that firms adopt will have to adjust to the point where it a firm will be indifferent between changing its wage policy. And again, we're thinking about constant returns. So we're describing a single firm looking for a single worker. And you could expand this to think of a large, you know, larger dimension or number of, of massive workers at a certain point. But we're not going to do that. So we're just going to consider the, the strategy of trying to get a worker at different points in the wage dif distribution. So this is a really clever, simple way of getting, getting a, 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 a solid answer. So let me take you through the, the steps to do that. Okay, so if a firm posts a wage, and you can think of this as a firm entering the market, 
or a firm already in the market paying W and looking to the left and looking to the right and asking what can the firm do better by changing the wage by epsilon? Okay, so. And we've, we've kind of assumed that the firm, ha there's a maximum um, wage out there. Okay. Who accepts, who arrives and accepts that wage? Okay, so think about what I'm saying. I'm asking if a firm is posting W, and that W is somehow offered to some worker on the wage distribution G. Is that worker going to accept it or reject it? Okay. So you can think of, first off, you have to think about arrivals from unemployment. Some people are unemployed and are arriving at your, at your offer, and they may take it, they may not, but they will definitely take it because anything you offer has to be acceptable. Otherwise, why would you post it? Right? So it has to be greater than WR. So the answer is arrivals. I'm going to write it out in English. Arrivals from unemployment. plus arrivals from those who earn less than W. So if a guy's coming from somewhere else in the G distribution and he arrives at your door and he's making less than what you're offering, he'll take it. But if he's making more, he won't take it. Okay, again, the, the idea behind this, these models with friction is that people are just kind of randomly coming to you from different directions. I mean, you could probably change that with Waiting it somehow if you wanted to, but right now we're just going to take a we do exactly what they do in their in their paper. So plus arrivals from from previous wages. Let's, let's write it this way: from previous wages less than W. Okay, and again, risk aversion means they, they just take it. They're just going mean, to, risk neutrality means they take it. They're not risk averse. They're going to take the job. So you're basically got these two sources of inflow. We can write them down. So what's the arrivals from unemployment? Well, we know that all accept. Okay, so it's going to be the rate of, it's going to be rated, this, this rate of unemployment. Um, all that, It's the mass of unemployment, and I, I'm pretty sure this is right. I'm just going to write it down because it's alpha plus lambda, lambda plus alpha. Because all accept. Why do they accept? They all accept because lambda zero equals lambda one, and there's no there's no difference. Okay. and WR equals B, okay? And then plus arrivals coming from those earning less than W, that's just gonna be one minus U star, that's the mass of employed people times the wage distribution at W, okay? So all those people who earn just up to W would be candidates, um, for this um, right okay so this means that again think of we're looking from the firm's perspective the probability the probability of an acceptance when I choose W as a strategy, is gonna be equal to lambda divided by lambda plus alpha plus one minus U, the mass of people who are working, times the mass of all workers were earning less than or equal to W. Okay, so we can actually plug in from the previous expressions what we had, given all the assumptions I've made to get this far. Okay, so let's do that. 
Um, lambda is a primitive parameter. Alpha is a primitive parameter. U is not a primitive parameter. U is equal, equal to uh, lambda divided by lambda plus alpha, and therefore 1 minus u is going to be equal to alpha divided by lambda plus alpha. Okay, and the, the g distribution that we derived under these simplifying assumptions would be lambda times f of w plus lambda plus alpha times 1 minus f of w. Okay, so think of this as the probability of, of getting an acceptance um, given all my possible alternatives, I choose w, this is what my rate's going to be. Okay, so again, that's, that's going to affect my profitability, it's going to affect the ability of me to get a worker and produce. If I don't have a worker, I can't produce, I don't have any profits at all. And if I overdo it, then I'm going to lose a lot of money through my um, the direct cost of having the worker uh, and I'm paying that worker W. Okay, so we can we can actually write this down. We can think of it this this is like this is going to face a firm is facing this this probability of acceptance, and then we'll have to just just consider all these different op alternatives. But to do that, we have to write down the profit function of the firm. So what again? This is a simple model. The periodic profit of a firm with a worker, because you can't produce without a worker, you have no profits at all in place, is equal to y minus w. So we're going to make this simple as possible. So y is exogenous, y is just given to us. Put a bar on top if you want. That makes you help, helps you think about it. So y is given. So therefore, if I every period if I have a worker in place, if I pay a higher wage, I'm going to have a little bit less turnover, but I'm going to lose profit directly. And if I pay a lower wage, I'll make more money in the short run, but I'm probably going to lose that worker at some point. So to make this really sing, we need a discount rate. We always we know what a discount rate is. We always used um, R. So discount rate of R, and that means a discount factor of one over one minus, or one, one plus R. Okay, so that's the factor I apply to future earnings. Okay, so now we're gonna to try to write down the profit of the firm considering all these different alternatives. So the firm already, you know, the, you, you, can, you could take two different approaches. You can think of a firm already with a worker in, the, in hand, or you can think of a firm entering a market at any point along the potential wage distribution and asking what the profits would be. Okay, so we'll, we'll do it really slowly. We'll say, um, we're gonna consider the, the probability of losing a worker if you have a worker, because right now we've only gotten the probability of acceptance so now we have to fi figure out what, what the worker, um, what the consequences of losing a worker for setting the, a different wage would be. So what's the probability of losing a worker conditional on having a worker, okay? And conditional on, on paying that worker W. Okay, so, so I'm asking the question, you're already on the, you're already, you've got a worker in place, you're paying that worker W. Um, what is the probability of losing that worker? So there's two, there are two prob sources of probability uh, of losing that worker. What is the first one? Exogenous. Thing blows up on its own, and we call that lambda, right? Right, so the, the probability of losing that worker exogenously, call that lambda, plus the probability the worker gets a better offer from somewhere else, right? A better offer 
W that's greater than W. Okay, because the workers, you're paying, you're paying this, and if, and what's that arrival rate? It's alpha times one minus F, okay, which we're going to eventually derive. But given what the other guys are doing, so this is what the market is is offering. Okay, so this is again, think of these arrivals occurring stochastically, but given they arrive at your probability of losing a worker is going to depend on how well you paid your current worker. If you pay him well, then f of w is going to be relatively um, high, so then the probability of losing that worker is going to be low. Okay, so that's, the, that's what we want to think about. That's the probability of you um, losing a worker given your wage strategy uh, w. All right, so now we can actually try to write down expected profits for a risk-neutral firm dealing with this situation at um, a different situation. So we can, have a, we can think of the expected profits having a worker in hand, and then we can think of the expected profits of, of not having a worker, and then we can aggregate those. So if you, if you enter the market, you know, you can have a worker or not. Those two states of the world have different profits associated with them. So let's try to put this together. So the, the expected value of the profit, and again, I'm talking about the, the, um, the expected, let, let's, let's use the notation um, pi to, to, be the, to be the discounted profits from now until the end of time. Okay, so the, uh, this way firms sort of or you can always discount with a higher rate if you don't like that, um, et cetera. Okay, so the firm needs to wait one period before the starts production, so let's just start with beta times R minus, uh, Y minus W. Okay, so that's the discounted value of the profits after one period, worker in hand. Next period, what happens? You had a worker, and then something happened. So either the worker didn't get an offer from somebody else, or the worker did get an offer. And if the worker did get an offer from somebody else, is it a, an offer that poaches your worker? Do you lose the worker? Or did you pay enough? It's a probabilistic event. Okay? So let's try it. How would you do this? It's, it's, it's fun. This is what economics is all about. Writing down present values, expected present values, finance, that kind of stuff. It's exactly what they do in this, in this paper. Okay, so that's the first period. This is the first period. And then we add the discounted value of the second period. So if we discount, we've discounted using beta for the first period. What do we need to discount for the second period? Beta squared, right? So write down beta squared, please. And then the probability that I didn't lose my worker to a poacher or I didn't lose it because my, I lost an, had an exogenous loss of the worker. We just derived that. The probability of losing a worker, it was 1 minus lambda minus alpha times 1 minus f of w. Okay, so this is the, this is the probability that your, job, your worker blows up just exogenously, and this is the probability that somebody comes along and gives them a better offer than you were paying already. F is the offer distribution already out there. We're going to derive it. Okay, you see? So let me close this, and then what do I have to multiply this by? I have to multiply this by Y minus W. The assumption is that we're, we're comparing steady state strategies for this, this W. So if you pay W once, you're paying it for the rest of time, and these are the consequences. We're not considering one period deviations from the strategy, okay? So we're still not done. That, that's only period two. What about period three? It's kind of easy to see what's happening now, right? Can, period three is going to be beta to the third power. And then what's the probability that you didn't lose, given this wage strategy, your worker in two periods in succession? Well, it's going to be the, it's going to be the product of that probability with itself because, you, you know, it's, it's a matter of luck in this model. It's all chance. Okay, so that's going to be 1 minus 
lambda minus alpha 1 minus f of w close parentheses squared times r minus w and as um, we know you can you can think of dot 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 as the rest of the infinite future okay this is a geometric uh, sum and everything everything is either constant or it's a power of something less than one so it's going to converge we can actually uh, try to write down that formula okay remember this is this is the profit of having a worker in hand okay so you also have to think about what happens if you don't have a worker and then we're going to look at what happens if you just get thrown into the market with or without a worker and you just have to swim all right so this this expression is going to be you can you can do it yourself if you want you can factor out the beta the common term is beta times r um, y minus w and then you've got a sum from i from zero to infinity of beta to the ith power one minus lambda minus alpha times one minus f of w to the ith power remember beta is one over one plus r it's the discount factor has to be less than one so that looks like a really convenient fa we can figure that out right it's an it's a geometric uh, sum an infinite geometric sum so we can we can simplify that quickly so e of pi w and again this is with worker put it in parentheses because I keep forgetting to emphasize that it's going to be equal to y minus w divided by r plus delta plus alpha times 1 minus alpha sorry clutch f w okay so here you see the trade-off this is just the profits we're not done yet but this is just to highlight um, various things that make money for you you raise your wage you lose profits but you also get profits because you, you, you're going to affect this probability of retention and you're also going to uh, going to kill your profits directly so if you, if you meet somebody from the German Confederation of Industry that are complaining that they have no workers, you hear this on the, on the TV all the time, I mean, you see it on TV, you know, they're always complaining, oh, we can't get any workers. Well, you know, either you pay them better wages or you just have to deal with it, right? That's just the way it is. And, and the labor market right now is, is, is a different labor market than we had 20 years ago. So th that's why I like this model so much. It highlights these two conflicting sources of um, tension in the labor in the in the profitability of firms okay so we're still not done yet but we're close um, we're gonna what is the profit profitability of not having a worker okay so what is the profitability what is the profit without a worker Okay, so it's going, to be the, it's going to be literally the probability of getting a worker with your posted wage times what we just derived. Okay? Profitability, having a worker in hand. So, so not having a worker must be the probability of finding a worker times this probability of this profitability of having expected profits of having a worker in hand okay so therefore um, I'll write it out in, in no worker is going to be equal to the probability of getting a worker probability of getting a worker conditional on the wage times what we just did before the expected value paying worker worker in hand 
Okay, so now we, just, we already have that. We know what that is. Um, and we can just substitute. So the answer is going to be lambda times lambda plus alpha times 1 minus f of w. So that's the probability of just getting any, if you're given wage policy, just the, the chance of getting an arrival that will accept. Okay, it could be someone coming from somewhere else in the wage distribution, or it could be someone coming from um, unemployment, and then the profitability, which we just derived up here, y minus w divided by r plus lambda plus alpha times 1 minus f of w. Okay, so this is the magic number. This is the expected profit posting W, no worker in hand. Okay, so um, this is really an important point. This is the profitability that, and then, again, the, the firms are pretty clever. They understand this. They know what lambda is. They know what alpha is. What, is, what they don't know is, or what in effect their, their behavior will determine is F. Because we're gonna, now, we're gonna ask a firm, can, what can make a firm indifferent? Because F is what the others are doing, what the others are offering. So it's, it's gonna be kind of like a Nash equilibrium. Everyone is gonna take the behavior everybody else has given, and what can I do to make myself as well off as possible, or can I improve my situation by changing my wage a little bit in the positive direction or in the negative direction? And the equilibrium concept will be there is no gain. So the profit across the wage distribution for various choices of W is the same. So that's the way these guys derive an equilibrium. I'm going to write that out in words now. So an equilibrium is defined as it's going to be an F that generates indifference in profits, in expected profits, on any point of the observed wage distribution. So you have no incentive to change. If you're, if you're offering 10 euros an hour, if you raise it to 11, your profits won't go up because everyone else is doing something that will make sure that it doesn't go up. It's basically by construction, there'll be no improvement of profits relative to what you're doing right now. And I'm going to show that formally, using that is enough to give us F. Okay, so using that little assumption, and this we've already put a lot of restrictions in the model. This is a very special model. Um, we can actually generate a closed form for F. I mean, we already we already generated a, a kind of a closed form for for G. So we got G chasing F and F chasing G. There's going to be a, a common solution to that problem. Okay, so an equilibrium. is defined, and this is a special case, of course, we have, what did we assume? We assumed alpha zero equals alpha one equals alpha. We assumed, um, well, we assumed a value for lambda, um, risk neutrality, what? Uniform. Yeah, no, no, we didn't, you don't need uniform for this. Uniform was for, w, for F to generate G. This is actually more general. Um, that's the whole point. We actually we don't need that. OK, so equilibrium defined as a wage offer distribution F defined on the support is taking it into, again, it's, it's what a cumulative distribution is. For which any wage posted posted generates 
the same profit, expected profit, given by the expression star, which is this. Okay. So it's kind of like a, a boundary condition. We're just going to basically think of this as like a, it's, de, it's defining some function. Now we're just going to put some conditions on it. We're going to put an end, end point condition and we're going to put a, a condition that basically the, that the change of this profit for any given point is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so many ways to do this. The easy way to do this would just to say that expected value of pi um, I'm just going to use the notation that we had before which says that Okay, so for any W and W prime, you're, there's no improvement of profit or no difference in profit. Um, and this is for all W and W prime that are from the B. That was our other assumption that, um, you know, we said that already. Alpha 1 equals alpha 0, therefore B is equal to WR, and that's equal to the, the reservation wage, okay? Um, and W prime from the same region, okay? So all we have to do is literally to, to, to find this uh, F, all we have to do is use that expression, this wonderful expression, and just plug in any arbitrary values of W and W prime that impose equality. And of course, we probably want to also pin down the endpoint of the distribution. And we already know, we know that um, the reservation wage is equal to B. So it's kind of like a boundary condition. That will help us as well. Um, let me write that down. Think of that as a, because remember, when you, solve, when you solve for F, we're looking for a function. We're looking for something like this, right? It's not going to look like that particularly in this case, but that's F. And this is the, the reservation wage, and this is the upper bound. Okay, so we, we need to pin this guy down. What is going to be WR? And we already know that because we know that the model generates WR automatically. By setting alpha 0 equal to alpha 1, the reservation wage has to be equal to B. And therefore, F of B has to be zero. Okay, so you know, if you get the if you get the unemployment benefit as a wage offer, it's a mass zero event, but if it happens, you're not gonna you're not gonna take it because you could just keep on getting your benefit or your income in unemployment. So that's that's the end point we're gonna pin down right away. We're gonna be able to pin down B. Okay? Implicitly, we'll be able to pin down the upper bound of the distribution because workers are equally productive in this model. Gesundheit. Workers have equal productivity. So the maximum wage that, that, uh, the, that these crazy firms are going to offer has to be bounded. And w, bound, w bar, upper bar doesn't have, we don't have infinite degrees of freedom to say what we think the upper bound of the distribution is. It's going to be, dis it's going to be determined endogenously by this model. So that's what really is really exciting about this, the Burdett Mortensen story is that they can actually solve for the maximum offer wage if um, productivity is finite. Okay, so we'll do that. It's actually very easy. Um, because we already know if all profits across the distribution are equal, and they also have to be the, the same profit you would be getting if you offered the reservation wage. By definition, by construction, the equilibrium has to be such that if I pay um, a higher wage than B, it must be yielding me the same profit as I would be getting if I just paid B. And there are some firms out there that try it, right? They try to pay you nothing. 
but you leave in instantly. You get it on your CV and you leave. That's the idea behind in this model. Okay, so that's gonna that's gonna help pin down that's gonna help pin down the F distribution. Okay, so how? Um, let's go through the steps. We've got about five minutes, ten minutes to do it. We can still we can still make it. Okay, so the expected profits of that terrible employer that's offering B <laughs> by construction has to be the same as the profit, expected profits for an employer who pays a lot more than B because that latter employer has more retention, loses fewer workers. But we can still figure out the expected value at B. Okay, just go back to the formula we derived before and plug it in. What do you get? You get lambda times a pretty huge profit because you're getting all you're getting all the surplus if you like okay um, the worker's only getting what he would have gotten anyway and then you've got lambda plus alpha times one minus f of b and then I'm going to close this brace open it again and put r plus lambda plus alpha times one minus f of b. Okay, so now we can already start evaluating this. What is the probability of getting someone to take your job if you give them b? In other words, what is this value? You're offering the worker the worst possible wage. What is the probability of acceptance? It's gonna be zero. So that's the bottom of the offer distribution. You can try it. I mean, you can't do worse. You can't be stingier than that, so to speak. The probability of, um, of observing firms that offer that wage B is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so you can put in zero here. Now, of course, this is the reason why firms would try to do that. If they can keep the worker for one millisecond, it's going to make lots of money, but the worker's going to be gone very quickly because the worker keeps getting these arrivals according to, if, if, if there's a positive arrival rate at all, the workers will bid away very quickly. They'll be climbing up the ladder, okay? So we can simplify this considerably. It's gonna be lambda times y minus b divided by alpha, or lambda plus alpha times r plus lambda plus alpha. Okay, so you can see this is all parametric. Y is given to us by the model. It's, every worker has the same productivity. Every worker has the same opportunity cost of time in, in unemployment. Every worker has the same incidence rate of job or job uh, worker firm dissolution. And every worker has the same discount rate. Every firm has the same discount rate. And every uh, labor market has the same alpha. Okay, so this is a constant. The level of profits for the firm in this model, if you take this condition seriously, is given. There it is, right there. All right, so now we can, this is, this is given, right? This is um, a constant. But we know that if a firm raises its wages, it's gonna make more money because it can retain workers longer, but it's gonna lose profits because it's paying higher wages. So there's the trade-off. So we just have to equate that for any W to that object, okay? Because we've already, we've derived the expected profits at the worst possible wage. Now we'll just take any wage and see what we get, okay? So for all W from the interval B to W upper bar, and we're gonna solve for W upper bar. Okay, it must be the case that the workers, the firm is indifferent between offering some other wage and offering that lousy wage and accepting that much turnover. Okay, so um, that means thus the profits of paying another wage, which we already derived, I'll write it out in completeness now, lambda plus alpha one minus f of w times r plus lambda plus alpha one minus f of w 
has to be equal to what we just derived here. So I'll write it out. Lambda r y minus b lambda plus alpha r plus lambda plus alpha. Okay, and remember that we said that was a constant. So now we we got it. We got it. Literally, we've got it. We just have to solve for f. And fortunately, f only appears in very limited places here. Okay, and this is again why the model is kind of special. Otherwise, you have to use numerical methods. Look how f appears here, and f appears here. So we, and it appears in such a way that I bet you we can solve for it. <laughs> okay, it's going to involve a square root, but it's still going to be okay. Okay, and again, most in most cases, it's a general. It's kind of a general result. If you if you give me a g, I can give you an f, and but if I, you're going to have to solve for it using numerical methods because it doesn't really does, doesn't have a closed form. That's why this is kind of a nice teaching uh, example to use. Okay, so what is f? If you do the algebra, f of w is equal to lambda plus alpha divided by alpha times 1 minus square root of y minus w, y minus b. That's it. Basta. Okay? So again, this model is really special. And you know it's special because we put all this extra baggage on it. We didn't assume uniform distribution, but we did assume arrival rates of the same magnitude in, in work and not at work. We know that, that can be different. Of course, it has big difference, it has a big effect on the reservation wage. It makes everything more complicated. If you read the original paper, they do that. So they allow the arrival rate when working, when not working, when unemployed to be different. And it, it changes this, it's a much nastier expression, but it's still close form. Okay, and I'll write it down next time. But I, I just want to finish this part. This is really great. So we've got, we've got F. We, we found that you can go in one direction and you can go in the other direction. And this model, we actually can get F and G from a very simple set of assumptions. All you need is friction. We solved the diamond paradox. Workers are all the same in this model. They're in this, literally in this bathtub, and they're just bumping into each other randomly at an exogenous rates that we have, we have assumed, okay? But you're able to get a distribution from that. So what, last, last but not least, you should be able to, to do some other mini manipulations on your own. I'll, I'll do it, I'll just write down the results. Remember, f of b, what is f of b? Zero. Better b. Is it? Yes. Is it, is it zero? If you put in b for here, it turns into one. Square root of one is one. Last time I looked, one minus one is equal to zero. So check. Okay, equals zero. What about w upper bar? Remember I told you that's actually endogenous in this model. You can solve for it. Firms would be crazy to pay y greater than y, a wage greater than y, right? That's they wouldn't do that anyway, but you could ask the question, but they don't. In fact, it's going to be a less than y. So do, how would you figure that out? How would you figure out w upper bar? Well, you know f of w upper bar has to be equal to what? Has to be equal to y, right? So just plug it in and see what happens. Plug in w upper bar and solve for it. Um, it's equal to one equal to lambda plus alpha divided by alpha root one minus, no, one minus root w, or r minus w bar divided by y minus b, 
and then therefore you can solve for W upper bar, which is this very intuitive <laughs> expression. It's got to be less than Y, so it's going to be Y minus something, Y minus Y minus B times lambda divided by lambda plus alpha squared. Okay, so if you stare at that long enough, you see that workers would, firms will never pay a wage that's higher than Y. That would be complete silliness, but it also plays considerably less than Y, depending on this gap, the gap between the, the surplus of the firm, if the work gets nothing, and what the worker can get. So if the worker has a high unemployment benefit, that's going to make it very hard for the firms to be really chintzy on the, pro, on the wage offer because they're not going to make any money. So the higher, the higher B is, um, the higher the acceptance wage is going to be ceteris, ceteris paribus. And of course, it all depends on these frictions. So that's the diamond paradox solved. Those frictions have to be positive. Otherwise, the model doesn't work. You have to have people losing their jobs, and you have to have people getting random offers from elsewhere in the, in the wage distribution. So that's the magic of Burnett uh, Mortensen in two hours. Um, and next time we'll, we'll sort of probe the last frontiers of, of this area. I mean, there are many frontiers, I'm being sarcastic. Huge area. Uh, what happens if you allow for workers to have different productivity, for example? We, now, how would you do that? You'd have to have a, a strategy for the firm to turn down workers that don't, aren't productive enough. The firms have to be able to observe productivity, and the firms have to be able to um, know what the other firms are doing. So you have the same kind of strategic issues involved. Um, you can also have different willingnesses of workers to work. So you could have different Bs for different workers. So, 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 and you might not even know. You might, some workers don't come with a B on their forehead. You have to learn about those workers' behavior. So, you know, obviously this is the springboard for lots of different types of models which are much more complicated. So next time I will talk about that briefly and I'll talk about how firms can learn about workers on the job, how learn, workers can learn about their own productivity on the job. That's the so-called Jovanovich model. And then I'll finish by talking about um, what we call directed search. This model assumes that everyone's looking the same everywhere around, around uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a fairly undirected way. But you could actually choose what markets to search in. And firms could choose to search in markets to get certain types of workers. So you could define labor markets as, as um, self-contained um, opportunities for firms and workers to find themselves. And that could be defined on skill, could be defined on industry, location, whatever. And then you can decide what kind of strategies um, could firms have um, in the same kind of sense that we've had today with this, this very general model. Okay, so there's a lot to, that one could keep doing. And, you know, there's a lot of, lot of uh, research that can be done. And we haven't even talked about applying this to, to the data. But um, we'll talk about those things next week when we finish. Okay, so thanks for coming.